Some might wonder, um, with, with the scale of the crises and instability that we're facing across the world at present, why we, uh, as Marxists, who've set ourselves the task of uh, preparing for the, the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, are dedicating so much time to this question uh, of philosophy. Is, is this a bit of a luxury or an indulgence? Is this, is, uh, what relevance does this have uh, to the class struggle? And that skepticism um, is, is understandable, uh, given the manner in which philosophy is presented to most people today, which is largely in the form of kind of dense, convoluted and obscure discussions that tend to begin and end within the walls of university libraries and seminar rooms and seem almost purposefully unintelligible to, to people outside of those circles. Um, and that might lead some to, to dismiss the whole endeavor of philosophy as, as completely inconsequential uh, or unnecessary. Um, but this would be a mistake, uh, because as Marxists, uh, our approach to philosophy uh, is not a purely academic pursuit, uh, but it's also a guide to action, uh, a vital weapon in the task we have set ourselves of, of changing the world, of liberating the great mass of humanity. Um, and if we're going to be successful in that task, we have to be uh, clear and consistent in our worldview. We can't afford to be uh, muddled and, and unprincipled in our ideas or get uh, uh, distracted by, by short-term trends. Um, and this kind of long-term understanding means that we have to take a serious approach to philosophy. And ultimately, a philosophy is something that everyone has, whether or not they realize it. Uh, those that claim that they have no philosophy or don't need a philosophy uh, will actually often tend to merely kind of absorb and reflect uh, the prevailing ideas and prejudices uh, that are common uh, in the society that they live in. Um, as Marx and Engels wrote uh, in a work called The German Ideology, quote, the, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. They are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relationships. Um, and these uh, these dominant ideas are conveyed to, uh, to each of us on a daily basis uh, through the media, through schools and universities, through entertainment. Uh, and in the context of, of our contemporary society, uh, in which the global capitalist system is uh, all over in a state of uh, malaise and stagnation, um, those prevailing ideas tend to be overwhelmingly conservative, pessimistic, and wholly unimaginative. And this is not accidental. The, the, the bourgeoisie, the, the ruling class, the dominant class in our society, uh, have precious little faith in their ability to offer any kind of appealing future to humanity. And as such, bourgeois philosophy uh, can offer nothing remotely inspiring or insightful. It offers no hope to the future, so it kind of contents itself uh, with just attempting to, to ward people away from, from any kind of uh, revolutionary alternatives um, with either tired, conservative, platitudes uh, or kind of obscure um, uh, uh, kind of um, convoluted examinations uh, of, uh, of uh, you know you know largely obscure questions um, and these ideas might often come dressed up in uh, kind of erudite or sometimes even radical language, but their essence is the same. Um, we're repeatedly told um, that there's, uh, there's no real such thing as, as progress, that humans are naturally greedy and selfish, uh, that the present society is the best we can hope for, uh, and that attempts to change it are, are doomed to failure. Now, the fact that you've, gathered, you've, all, you've all gathered in this room today uh, tells me that you're not entirely satisfied with those conclusions, and you're not alone. Um, the, all over the world, uh, millions of workers and youth are searching for a way out of this bankrupt and decrepit system. And if you're looking to understand how we go about finding an alternative, you need a philosophy. You need a framework and a theory uh, that will help you to understand and interpret the world so that you can fight to change it. Um, and the only the only set of ideas, the only consistently revolutionary philosophy that offers the, the tools required for this task uh, is the philosophy of Marxism, which is known as dialectical materialism. Okay, so um, this, this philosophy of dialectical materialism uh, did not spring fully formed uh, from the minds of Marx and Engels uh, sometime in, in the 19th century. Uh, rather, Marx and Engels uh, themselves were students of philosophy, uh, and they based their own ideas on the highest level of development uh, within bourgeois philosophy. 
um, which at their time was, was far more dynamic and revolutionary uh, than it appears to us today. Um, and similarly, those bourgeois philosophers represented uh, the culmination of a, a long historical process of development within human thought that stretches um, back thousands of years um, all the way to, to the early stages of society. Um, the advent of philosophy, in fact, coincides uh, with the development of, of an economic surplus and the division of society into classes. For those of you who attended the, the talk on historical materialism earlier, you might already have had uh, something of an int introduction to these questions. But this development uh, meant that a small layer of people uh, were released uh, from the burden of having to labor to produce the things they needed uh, to survive on a daily basis. Uh, instead, their needs uh, were taken care of uh, by the majority who labored to, to produce this surplus. And this allowed that layer, this emergent ruling class, uh, the free time necessary to consider questions of science, mathematics, uh, and indeed philosophy. Um, and the most significant instance where a slave society, which is the mode of society um, that, we, that, we, uh, that we're examining here, um, was able to, to support um, the, these kind of breakthroughs um, in thought uh, in this way was, was in ancient Greece. Um, because it was here that we saw the first attempts by philosophers to explain nature purely in terms of nature. So without uh, invoking any kind of religious or spiritual or supernatural entities uh, to explain explain the world around them. Um, and these philosophers, uh, these early Greek philosophers, made incredible discoveries for their time. Uh, some examples are that they, uh, they measured the circumference of the Earth uh, with quite a high degree of accuracy. They developed uh, a limited understanding of matter and, uh, and, and atoms. Uh, they also discovered uh, a limited form of evolution uh, by studying human embryos. Um, and these achievements rested upon a materialist philosophy. Um, and now materialism, uh, in the philosophical sense, um, means something entirely different uh, to how we might use that term in, in a colloquial, everyday sense. Um, it doesn't refer to kind of consumerism or greed or anything else that we might associate um, that word with in our everyday use. Uh, a materialist philosophy is one that views the material, physical world as primary, uh, as something that exists uh, independently of, of human perception or, or sensation or thought. And to illustrate this, uh, we, we might consider the, the slightly cliche question uh, of if a tree falls in the forest with no one around to hear, does it make a sound? Uh, now, a materialist would answer unequivocally, yes. Uh, the sound generated by the falling tree is, is not dependent in any way upon an external observer. Uh, matter and the material world exist, uh, whether or not conscious beings are there to perceive it. Uh, and, and indeed, our own consciousness, our, our being, our, our ability to perceive things um, is subject to the material world. It's, it's part of, uh, of, of the external world we inhabit. Um, and because matter is, is primary in this way, we can therefore say that our, our ideas um, are, are secondary to matter. They're, they're products of the material world. Um, they don't exist outside of it or independently of it in the kind of uh, sort of realm or plane of thought uh, that's somehow different um, from other aspects of our world. So hum human consciousness, put simply, um, is merely the result of matter being organized in, in such a way that it has become conscious of itself. Um, um, there's more to say on that, which I'll come uh, uh, on to later, but that is, that is really the essence of it. <coughs> now, this point of view um, puts materialism, and particularly Marxism, uh, which is... Um, uh, which is a consistently materialist philosophy. Um, this, points that, uh, this, this puts that our point of view in opposition uh, to another school of thought, of thought called idealism. Um, and philosophical idealism generally holds that uh, thoughts and ideas uh, exist uh, kind of independently somewhat of, of the material world, uh, or that material reality uh, can't exist uh, without something to perceive it or can't be made sense of um, outside of our perception. Um, so where idealists would, would view matter as, as primary and as the driving force of reality, um, idealists um, would tend to see material reality as being kind of subordinate to our ideas or even sometimes as, as like a projection of our thought. Um, and this school of thought has largely been dominant uh, throughout much of the history of philosophy. 
And that dominance can be attributed in part to the nature of, of how philosophy emerged and, and developed out of class society, um, which I, I touched on earlier. So the division of a society into classes between those uh, who worked and those who lived off the labor of others uh, created a, a further division uh, between mental and manual labor. So the ruling class throughout society um, have tended to be more educated uh, and more concerned with uh, kind of the world of ideas uh, than the laboring classes whose thoughts have been, by nature of their position in society, more preoccupied with the kind of every, everyday needs and demands of, of survival. Um, and as such, uh, the ruling class, who are kind of more uh, sort of bound up uh, in this study of ideas uh, and of philosophy, um, in attempting to justify and rationalize their own elevated position in society, um, have also tended to elevate um, this, this idea of the, the world of ideas as being somehow more refined or more significant uh, than the mundane and imperfect material world, um, which was, of course, the world of work, the world that the, was occupied by the laboring masses. Um, um, and this prejudice in favor of idealism uh, is particularly apparent in a lot of the later ancient philosophy like that of, of Plato, um, and also particularly during the era of feudalism, uh, where the dominance of the church uh, imposed a kind of expressly religious idealism uh, upon most uh, European uh, philosophy. Um, this begins to change, however, during the Enlightenment period. Um, and during this time, uh, we see the, the revolutionary bourgeoisie, uh, which emerged in countries like France and England um, and, and came into conflict with the established feudal order. Um, in, in this clash, one of the weapons that was wielded by the bourgeoisie in this battle uh, was a revolutionary philosophy, a materialist philosophy. Um, so for them, for, for the Enlightenment philosophers, all uh, preconceived uh, notions and prejudices uh, were to be stripped of, of their idealist veneer and measured purely in terms of reason, uh, which was incredibly groundbreaking for its time. Uh, it was a significant breakthrough and reflected the, the confidence and the dynamism of of the bourgeoisie um, at a time when it was uh, when it was revolutionary, when it was driving society forward. Um, but this kind of materialism also had very serious limits. Uh, it's what we would describe actually as mechanical materialism, um, because in their, their justified uh, opposition to, uh, to some of the tenets of idealism, um, these philosophers sought to stress the fact um, that humans and their thoughts were subject to material forces and were molded by the society in which they lived. Um, now, this is, of course, true. Um, but in doing so, um, they treated human consciousness kind of as something inert, uh, kind of just a passive reflection of the material world. Um, and in this formulation, humans weren't really, um, uh, kind of only just really subject to the material world. Um, they didn't really take account for how uh, humans also interact with and engage with the material world uh, around them. Um, and this was a reflection um, uh, of the wider mechanical nature of this materialism, uh, which tended to conceive of nature and the universe uh, kind of as something static and constant, uh, rather than something in motion and, and subject to change. And it was over, in overcoming this mechanical outlook that Marx and Engels uh, were really able to uncover the true revolutionary potential of a materialist philosophy. So in their critique of, of this older materialism, uh, Marx and Engels explained how humans are not just uh, passively shaped uh, by external material forces, uh, we also act on those forces and we, and we in turn influence uh, the way that those forces uh, develop and, and, and affect our world. Um, and it's in this, in this process of kind of acting on the world around us uh, that our ideas uh, about the world take shape um, and we, we start to develop new ways of trying to change our surroundings uh, to suit our needs. And this, of course, doesn't just happen um, on an individual level. It's, it's a social process that takes place in increasingly uh, wider and more complex ways as, as society changes and develops to higher levels. Uh, and with every step that society takes, every development um, has its expression um, in the overall state of, of consciousness and in, in the ideas that tend to prevail um, throughout society. Um, and this sheds some light on um, one of the favorite topics 
critics of uh, Marxism's, um, shall we say, less imaginative opponents, uh, which is human nature, uh, which I imagine is something comrades encounter quite a lot um, as, a, as a rebuttal or, or a supposed refutation of Marxism. Um, is a very common notion in the sort of bourgeois conception uh, of human nature, um, that all humans share in common a kind of rigid, immutable, and unchanging set of characteristics um, or, or psychological uh, traits, uh, which usually include you know, greed, selfishness, laziness, um, and that these, tend, that these do, uh, uh, remain unchanged throughout history. Um, and Marx actually answers this contention uh, in a very short work uh, called Theses on Feuerbach, in which he writes, uh, human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual. In its reality, it is the ensemble of social relations. Um, and what he means by that is, is human nature, to, to the extent that we can discuss um, such a thing in a, in a kind of definitive way, um, human nature is not fixed. Uh, it's a product of, of history and of society. Um, and it's therefore, it, it responds to changes in society um, and disruptions in, in those dominant social relations. Um, and so all of these elements uh, taken together uh, demonstrate precisely why it is fundamental that any revolutionary philosophy, um, any philosophy that can act as, as a guide to changing society, has to have a materialist basis. Because materialism shows us that we don't actually exist apart from the material world, and we're also not just passively subordinate to it. Um, we're active participants in the world that we live in. And through our actions, we can change the world. We change society, change nature, and we also change ourselves. Um, now, this process uh, whereby we, we interact uh, and engage with, with this kind of living world uh, and how this process drives change uh, also brings us to the second uh, major characteristic of Marxist philosophy, which is dialectics. Um, so Engels said uh, that dialectics is nothing more than the science of the general laws of motion and development of nature, human society, and thought. Um, so this is quite an ambitious statement, uh, I think comrades will agree, um, and it's become quite fashionable uh, among the ranks of modern philosophers to kind of scoff at the notion uh, that philosophy or, or theory can offer us this kind of, of level of insight. Um, but I hope, uh, nevertheless, that I'll be able to demonstrate that dialectics uh, very much lives up to this, um, uh, this assertion by Engels. It's a rigorously worked out scientific method uh, that is a vital tool in understanding um, hugely important aspects of our world. Um, Essentially what it is, is a philosophy that's based on uh, the, the kind of interdependent processes uh, that govern society and nature and the universe. Uh, and it seeks to understand those processes, not as insular and static things, uh, but in their motion, in the way they, they interact with other processes and other things. Um, and through that understanding, it reveals, uh, once again, the role that we can play as human beings uh, in, in intervening those processes, influencing the, the, the direction of the motion uh, that they take. Um, so at the beginning, I, I referenced an attitude you encounter among some people who feel that uh, you know, they either don't need or don't have a philosophy. Um, and these people will often tend to limit their outlook to um, what is sometimes termed common sense. Um, in actuality, I would say common sense, um, uh, or, or what we tend to define as common sense, um, does actually relate to a very specific branch of philosophy, uh, which is called formal logic. Um, and formal logic um, is, is probably something that all of you use every day. Um, it's, it's generally based on a kind of simple set of axioms and propositions, the oldest of which are, are associated with Aristotle. Um, but the most basic of these kind of propositions uh, is that A is always equal to A. Um, so that means basically a, a thing is, is equal to another thing of the same uh, quantity and type. And formal logic uh, is extremely useful for a lot of everyday matters. Um, and it's, it's the foundation of much of the, the modern sciences and mathematics, etc. Uh, it re propelled a lot of the advances in scientific inquiry, uh, particularly those that began uh, during the Renaissance period and, and continued through the Enlightenment, uh, which allowed a, a massive wave of investigation uh, into different elements of nature. 
And these elements were dissected and broken down into their individual parts, which were placed into distinct classes and categories, providing a lot of the foundation for the, for the categorizations that we still use today. Um, and this kind of provided an enormous wealth of data and knowledge. Uh, and without this, our, our understanding of much of uh, the whole array of natural phenomena um, would, would not be possible. Um, but once again, like mechanical materialism, this mode of inquiry has its limits um, because it ultimately produces a narrow, uh, what we would call a metaphysical uh, mode of thought that views things uh, in terms of fixed and rigid categories. You know, the focus on kind of cataloging static individual components and their properties ultimately really gives very little sense of how these individual components interact with one another. Um, and it's therefore completely inadequate uh, when considering broader, more complicated processes. Uh, because closer examination uh, shows that the things that make up these, these categories and classifications that we use are not actually simple or fixed or absolute. Uh, they're riddled with contradictions and variations. Um, and Trotsky described uh, this mode of thought very well. Uh, he said that, quote, the fundamental flaw in vulgar thought, as he called it, lies in the fact that it wishes to content itself with motionless imprints of reality, which really consists of eternal motion. And by contrast, dialectics uh, allows us to understand the world in motion, uh, not as a kind of complex complex of, of fixed and absolute categories, um, but as, as uh, in terms of processes where, where things are in a constant state of flux and transformation. Now, dialectics is, is not a new idea. Um, as, as, as far as dialectics was put forward as, as a scientific idea, um, we can trace its origins back once again to the earliest Greek philosophers who I mentioned earlier. And particularly, a, a, a philosopher of particular importance to this question is someone called Heraclitus, um, who's famous for having kind of very sort of obscure and complex ideas, but they, they were also very profound ideas as well. Um, Engels described Heraclitus's thought in this way. Um, he said, everything is and is not, for everything is fluid, is constantly changing, constantly coming into being and passing away. And this statement is, of course, completely at odds with that axiom of formal logic we talked about earlier, where A is always equal to A. Um, because that has to mean, if A is equal, always equal to A, that, uh, that has to mean that A is constant and static. Um, uh, but in reality, if we look closely, we have to recognize uh, that there's no object or entity actually in existence uh, that, is, that is always constant and always equal to itself from one moment uh, to another. Um, you know, we have to ask ourselves, is, is a table uh, or a pound of sugar or a human being uh, really the same uh, from one moment to the next? Um, and the answer on a, on a kind of micro level is, is no. Uh, they're subject to constant processes of internal and external pressure and transformation. And these changes might not be apparent uh, necessarily from one moment to another, um, but over time, their kind of cumulative effects will become very clear. Um, you know, the wood uh, and metal on this table will, will rot and corrode. Uh, the, the sugar will crystallize. The cells of the body uh, will die off while others are renewed. Um, and, and this is really the essence of dialectical thought uh, that Heraclitus discovered. Um, everything is changing, is, is constantly in flux. We step and we do not step into the same stream, he said. We are and we are not. So there's a contradiction uh, that lies at the heart of all existence, um, particularly the existence of, of living things, of organic matter. Um, and that's a contradiction between continuity and change, uh, between kind of being and not being. Um, so in many respects, when I finish speaking, I'll, I'll possess many of the same attributes, appearance, memories as I did when I, when I first started speaking. Um, but in actuality, I'll have gone through a vast number of changes, uh, mostly invisible, uh, during that time. Um, and this contradiction um, is really the essence of existence. The, the tension generated by this contradiction uh, is what gives uh, movement and, and dynamism uh, to all matter. It's, as Engels said, it's the law of motion within the natural world, uh, but also within human society. Um, 
And now this kind of constant state of flux uh, doesn't necessarily mean that, that change takes place in an even manner in a way that we can necessarily just easily predict uh, from one moment to the next. Uh, so it's quite, it's quite a common misconception, actually, that, that significant changes in the natural world uh, or in human society happen gradually. Um, this, this has been a prejudice uh, held actually by, by some of the great minds of history that change happens on a, on a gradual and, and steady basis. Uh, for instance, Charles Darwin uh, believed that his own theory of ind uh, evolution indicated a slow, gradual process by which one species transitioned into another at a kind of measured and consistent pace. Um, and this view remained prevalent in evolutionary biology until quite recently. It's probably how, if you ask someone on the street, how a lot of people maybe still think about evolution. Um, and this notion that change occurs slowly and gradually without uh, sudden and unexpected disruptions uh, or disturbances uh, can be quite comforting in a way. Uh, and as such, that notion has its, has its reflection in politics. Um, you, you know, you have uh, people who are kind of alarmed uh, by the thought of, of stormy struggles and, and battles between classes, um, and they uh, prefer, prefer to uh, place an emphasis on kind of painstaking and piecemeal changes where society uh, gradually transitions uh, from, you know, kind of uh, progressively to a more just uh, state of being. Uh, without the need for kind of drastic or revolutionary action. Uh, and this trend has a name, it's, it's reformism. Um, uh, and actually, it's, it's quite common for, for people of this persuasion to say precisely that they favor an evolutionary approach to change rather than a revolutionary one. Um, and this is quite ironic, um, given that contrary to the assumptions of many people, um, and indeed contrary to Darwin's own understanding, evolution is actually anything but a slow, gradual, and peaceful process. Um, it's actually periodically beset uh, by all manner of disruptions and accelerations of great flowerings of biodiversity, like the Cambrian explosion, uh, followed by uh, devastating calamities that w wipe away millions of species, uh, like uh, with the end of the dinosaurs. Um, and, and uh, indeed, the, the same process um, uh, is, uh, is, um, is at play in, in many aspects of the natural world um, and, uh, and, and also in human society. And it's through um, uh, an examination of these processes uh, that we see that the fundamental laws of dialectics, which I'll explain in a moment, are continually being proven by the discoveries of modern science. So the old gradualist understanding of evolution uh, was ultimately overhauled uh, by the discoveries of an American scientist called Stephen Jay Gould, uh, who put forward a theory called punctuated equilibria. Um, and, and this showed that uh, evolutionary development was characterized by long periods of stasis, uh, interrupted by sudden, swift, and drastic changes that launched the whole process forward by great leaps. Uh, and the same principles can be applied to human history. We often see long, relatively undisturbed periods where change seems to occur at a very slow pace. Um, but these periods are also punctuated by sudden, abrupt changes through wars or disasters or, or indeed revolutions. Um, and yet this is not to say, as, as some adherents of, uh, of theories like postmodernism do, um, this is not to say that history is therefore just kind of random chaos, uh, that uh, it's you know, a kind of series of unpredictable changes uh, that we can't really decipher any sense from. On the contrary, the dialectical method, um, whether applied to, to nature or to society, um, allows us to decipher order from chaos. Um, it, it allows us to understand how sudden and unpredictable changes uh, actually have their roots in the accumulation of smaller changes uh, taking place below the surface. Um, and the philosopher responsible for rescuing this dialectical mode of thought and kind of giving a scaffolding to this method um, was the German philosopher Hegel. Um, and basing himself on um, the, the philosophical and scientific discoveries of the past, uh, Hegel was able to develop a profound understanding of the nature of change uh, and the forces behind it. And his philosophy, despite its shortcomings, which I will explain, um, was perhaps the single greatest influence on Marx's own ideas. 
in his, in his inquiries into the natural sciences, Hegel uh, was, was able to overcome a kind of empiricism that kind of reigned uh, at the time he was writing. Uh, which tended to view things uh, kind of in stasis and, and denied the existence of sudden great leaps forward in nature, the same kind of gradualist understanding I talked about earlier. Um, but Hegel uh, was able to recognize that, that change actually um, doesn't take place in, in a straight line, but that a series of small, uh, seemingly unremarkable changes could eventually give uh, rise uh, to sudden breaks in continuity. And he defined this as the law of quantity transforming into quality. Um, and it can be observed in all manner of, of natural phenomena, great and small. Uh, so for example, uh, a gradual quantitative change in the temperature of water uh, can uh, eventually result in a sudden qualitative change from solid to liquid, liquid to gas, and, and vice versa. Um, and to use an, another example that uh, potentially a bit close to the nerve, uh, the emergence of new COVID variants uh, also shows how small quantitative changes in the form of accidental mutations uh, in, in the biological makeup of the virus um, can, under the right circumstances, give way to a qualitative change in the nature of, of how the virus spreads. Um, and, and this, this example also illustrates one of the, the other key principles of Hegel's uh, dialectical method uh, for understanding change, um, which is what he called the, uh, which is the interplay of, of what he described as accident and necessity. Um, so this transformation of, of quantity into quality uh, can be triggered accident, actually by, by purely accidental uh, phenomena or events, uh, provided the existing uh, kind of buildup of quantitative uh, change and tension is sufficient, uh, that you only need a, a small catalyst um, to, for, the, for the change to become qualitative. Um, and these laws of development within nature um, apply also to, to the class struggle. Um, you might see that with, uh, within a single workplace or even within an entire country, um, the, the situation may face long periods of ebb in struggle, uh, where all manner of attacks and, and degradation seemingly are, are met with no response uh, from the workers. Uh, but eventually, uh, you know, a strike or, or a, a mass movement uh, can be triggered by seemingly accidental or, or even trivial matters. Um, but actually, it's, it's the preceding accumulation of of tension through wage cuts, redundancies, worsening conditions, aggressive treatment from bosses. These all create the conditions where this one accidental factor can be decisive. Um, and this is, uh, so in this sense, all situations, all natural and, and social orders, however stable and, and consistent they may seem, contain with them a wealth of contradictions. And the growing weight of these contradictions pre prepares the ground uh, for the emergence of a new order that, that negates the existing one. Uh, now, Hegel examined this process primarily through the development of, of human thought and philosophy. Um, so he didn't see his own thought or that of other philosophers as, uh, as simply emerging fully formed uh, from the minds of individual human beings. Um, he really saw the whole development of philosophy and scientific thought as a progressive unfolding uh, of truth and knowledge from, from low to higher levels. Uh, and within this process, each philosophy played a, pro a progressive role in developing our, our understanding of the world and the role we have within it. Um, but they also carried with them their own contradictions. Um, so once, once this progressive role had been fulfilled, it would ultimately collapse or reach a point where it's in, uh, the inherent tensions within this mode of thought meant that it couldn't go any further. Um, and that is until it was negated by a new mode of thought that could overcome these contradictions. Um, but even in that process of, of negation, uh, the rational kernel of each philosophy is, is preserved and built into the, the future development of human thought, while the kind of accidental or, or irrelevant appendages are, are discarded. Um, uh, and, this, and this leads to a kind of continual unfolding uh, of development from lower to higher levels, as I said. Um, and as with all forms of philosophy prior, this process is also evident uh, in the way that Marxist philosophy emerged out of a set of contradictory uh, tendencies within philosophy. Um, now, because of the mechanical nature of the, the Enlightenment-influenced uh, materialism, uh, a lot of the most significant advances in philosophy uh, made just before Marx and Engels became 
became active, um, were actually developed uh, through the idealist school of thought, um, most notably in, in, in the philosophy of Hegel himself. Um, so the limited nature of, of the materialism of his day meant that Hegel's dialectic was actually channeled uh, through the kind of prism of idealism, uh, which distorted or, or limited some of his conclusions. Um, Hegel, um, who, was, who was actually a very consistent idealist, um, viewed um, ideas not only as, as the driving force of reality, but he also considered all reality uh, to be attributable to uh, a kind of independent, what he called absolute idea um, that was primary in all things. Um, it's a very complicated uh, kind of concept to get your head around. Um, uh, and as such, it, um, it kind of blunted a lot of the, uh, the weight of Hegel's dialectical uh, conclusions. Um, but the material world, uh, in Hegel's view, uh, was merely a, a, an expression or reflection of this absolute idea. Um, uh, but his uh, philosophy, um, and for, for this reason, his philosophy um, was, was actually somewhat reviled uh, by, by the German bourgeois kind of radical contemporaries of Marx and Engels, um, who, have viewed, who viewed him as this kind of esoteric philosopher and associated him with the, the absolutist state um, of, of Prussia at the time. Uh, but by contrast, Marx and Engels recognized that there were, there were revolutionary implications in Hegel's dialectical method, um, but that it had been turned on its head uh, by his idealist worldview. Um, now, this, um, the, this kind of process by which they sought to unpick the basis of these errors is, is explained in detail uh, by Engels in a work called Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of Classical German Philosophy. Uh, but in essence, um, what it explains is that Marx and Engels were able to fulfill uh, the full potential of the dialectical method by placing it on a materialist footing, essentially reversing uh, Hegel's idealist formulation. Um, Marx uh, explicitly describes this. Um, he said that to Hegel, the life process of the human brain, the process of thinking, uh, which under the name of the idea, he even transforms into an independent subject, uh, is the creator of the real world. And the real world is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. With me, on the contrary, with Marx, um, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected in the human mind and translated into thorn forms of thought. Um, and this is a clear demonstration of the very process uh, of negation that Hegel had, had laid out uh, as the basis for this kind of progressive unfolding of knowledge from lower to higher levels. Uh, so Marx and Engels, uh, first of all, negated uh, mechanical materialism uh, by giving their materialism an appreciation uh, for, for the dialectical way that contradiction drives change and motion and development. And they also negated Hegel's dialectic by essentially turning it the right way up uh, by placing it on a materialist basis and by recognizing uh, the true relationship between uh, the material world and ideas. Um, so in, in this process of negation, by merging the dialectical and the materialist approaches, uh, both strands of philosophy were, were enriched and developed uh, to a higher level. Um, and I think this should be a, a, a clear illustration, um, as, as any, as to, to why we place so much emphasis uh, on our understanding of philosophy, because it was only through clarifying their own philosophy uh, and developing the, the contributions of their predecessors uh, while also correcting their mistakes uh, that Marx and Engels were able to uh, fashion a revolutionary theory um, that could act uh, both as a tool for analyzing society, uh, but also as, as a guide to practical action which is ultimately what Marxist philosophy is. Um, so Marx and Engels, in, in the same way that Hegel had demonstrated uh, in, in the realm of philosophy, uh, Marx and Engels demonstrated uh, that each mode of production uh, and its kind of attendant society and ruling class um, um, in history had, a, had one time uh, played a rational and progressive role. Uh, but over time, that progressive impetus turns into its opposite and the society enters a state of decay and decline. And this is true for our own society, just as it was once true for, for slave society and for feudalism. The logic of the capitalist system and the profit motive, which once played a highly uh, progressive role in expanding and concentrating the productive capacity of humanity, um, 
this, this has uh, been in the course of, of developing uh, the productive forces uh, to such monumental heights. Um, the progress, uh, this, this progressive development has now turned into its opposite, and it has plunged the capitalist system uh, into crises of, of overproduction and the very impulses that lent capitalism its dynamism and its vitality um, have now uh, become the sources uh, of its own decline. Um, yet at the same time, and I'll come to the end here, uh, these contradictions uh, bring forth the, the seeds of, of a new society that can now negate capitalism uh, while retaining its, its progressive essence in the form of a, a massive expansion of, of human production and capacity. Um, but that can now be turned to the genuine interest of, of human need. Um, and this application of, of the dialectical method to history um, is, is really what sets Marx and Engels apart from kind of other socialist thinkers who are more kind of uh, motivated by kind of moral indignation um, with capitalism. Marx's theory of historical materialism, um, which is, is the philosophy of dialectical materialism applied to human society, um, shows that it's precisely through the, the progressive development of the old order, um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the old mode of production, that the seeds of the new society are planted. Um, and it is through the kind of abundance uh, developed by centuries of capitalist accumulation uh, that, that socialism becomes attainable. Um, and a socialist revolution, therefore, doesn't just undo capitalism. Um, rather, it clears away the, the rot and the irrationality of the old system while retaining this abundance, um, and, and, but reorganizing that abundance on a, a planned, a scientific, a democratic basis. Um, and this is the goal um, of, of achieving that, that many of us uh, in this room have, uh, have dedicated ourselves to as Marxists. I hope by the end of this weekend, uh, there'll be even more of you who are committed to that goal. Um, um, and to that end, uh, we have to recognize the importance of a clear and consistent philosophy as a tool to, to understand and interpret the world, but also, most importantly, to change it. Thanks for coming.